two weeks ago when my wife and I went on vacation, I got a cold from my daughter and uh, the travel on the airplanes turned my right ear to become pretty much useless. So if I were to preach a sermon called Speak Up two weeks ago, it would have been a far different type theme. Today's theme for us, though, is an important theme, uh, particularly uh, for us as a church, but also for us as a community when we think about uh, who we are and the many gifts that God has given us, uh, there's a certain kind of responsibility that comes with that. And so with that in mind, let us pray together as we prepare to go to God's Word. Lord, we thank you on this morning that as we come into this place, we know we come here by invitation. And that invitation coming from your spirit. And so as, as we have gathered here, as we've come, uh, we pray, Lord, in the next few minutes as we hear from your word, help us to truly hear that word. Uh, Lord, quicken our understanding uh, that we might know what it is you have called us to and that we might, through the power of the Holy Spirit, be made bold in the way that we are your witness to this world. Through this and in this, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We return this morning to the book of Proverbs. Uh, this morning we actually turn our attention uh, in the series to chapter 31. Uh, in the first part of 31, uh, there is a section there that's attributed to a, a fellow named Lemuel. And Lemuel is sharing here at this proverb uh, what he calls motherly wisdom, something that his mom had shared with him. And so I think even though it's not Mother's Day, kids, listen to your mother's. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 8 tells us not to forsake our mother's teaching, so it's in, it's in a good stead there. Our mothers can be a, a source of great wisdom for us, a great role model, example, and their words can help us live a life of wisdom, a life that's not into foolish things. And I was thinking about college students going back uh, this morning and some going to college for the first time, and uh, we're going to look at the last two verses of uh, Lemuel's mother's teaching, but before we get to those two verses, uh, it's interesting to note what, he, what she says to her son, uh, this king. She says, be careful with the ladies and stay away from drinking. A good word, I think, as you prepare to go to college. How many kingdoms have been ruined by reckless relationships and how many have been wrecked by substance abuse? But as we come to our particular two verses, uh, we come to a, a text that uh, David Hubbard will observe in this when he says, equity, not aggrandizement, is the first duty of leadership. And so Lemuel's focus is to be what we see in verses 8 and 9. So hear this word. Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves for the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and the needy. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, by the time we get to Proverbs chapter 31, this idea of a wise ruler, this one who's a king who acts in righteousness, who does the right thing in the interest of God's people, it's not a new idea. In fact, Deuteronomy chapter 17, looking forward to that time when Israel would appoint a king, uh, sets these words out about that king. It says, they're supposed to make a copy of the law, and they're supposed to carry it with them at all times and review it regularly, because when they do so, those laws, those decrees, it's going to allow them to not consider themselves better than their fellow Israelites, and they will not turn from the law either to the right or to the left. And so in Proverbs, this idea of this wise ruler is identified with four different qualities that we see. One is they speak as God speaks. It says in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 10, the lips of a king speak as an oracle and his mouth does not betray justice. This king also will surround themselves with the right kind of influencers. And so it says in Proverbs 25, remove wicked officials from the king's presence and his throne will be established through righteousness. This king is supposed to bring stability to the kingdom through justice. It says in Proverbs 29, by justice, the king gives a country stability. And then lastly, we see that they are to judge fairly. And when they do, they will experience divine blessing. And Proverbs 29 goes on to say, if a king judges the poor with fairness, his throne will be established forever. And this idea is not just found in Proverbs, it's actually found in the psalmist, Psalm 72, a psalm that's attributed to King Solomon. It makes similar attributions when it says this, for he will deliver the needy, and it's talking about the king, for he will deliver the needy who cry out, the afflicted who have no one to help. He will take pity on the weak and the needy 
and save the needy from death. He will rescue them from oppression and violence. And I like this line here, for precious is their blood in his sight. And so the prophets will go on uh, when they talk to the people of Israel, people, the kingdoms that were out of whack at that point, kings that were living uh, for themselves. uh, The prophets will come and and what is the point they're going to judge them on? Jeremiah chapter 22, this is what the Lord says, do what is just and is what is right. And so all this stuff, this whole backdrop of Proverbs, this backdrop of Deuteronomy, this backdrop of Psalms is in mind. Do what is right. Rescue from the hand of the oppressor the one who has been robbed. Do no wrong or violence to the foreigner, the fatherless, or the widow. And do not shed innocent blood in this place. And this is just a sample. This is just a sample, a small sample of the text that color in this picture of the powerful advocating on behalf of the poor. And that idea is well attested to in scripture. It's God's stated expectation for leadership, for the leadership of his people, and for the ordering of this world. So let me ask this question. It's going to be rhetorical here. How's our nation's leadership doing? It was rhetorical. (laughs) How's our local leadership doing? How's our leadership doing? as in you and I. This idea of social concern is consistent throughout Scripture. In the law, we see Exodus 22, Leviticus 23 and 25, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 15 are all lists of places where the people were to live with with a sense, an eye towards social responsibility. How do we care for one another? And in each of those lists, the vulnerable are always listed. The marginalized are always listed. The ones we might call weak and poor, they're always listed. And there's special attention given to them that they're not to be forgotten. Isaiah uh, says this, and we get a picture of the heart of God on this issue. When Isaiah chapter 10, it says, Woe to those who make unjust laws, to those who issue oppressive decrees, to deprive the poor of their rights and withhold justice from the oppressed of my people, making widows their prey and robbing the fatherless. What will you do on the day of reckoning when disaster comes from afar? To whom will you run for help? Where will you leave your riches? And again, in Malachi chapter 3, same theme, these, the prophets once again, against those who defraud laborers of their wages, who oppress the widows and the fatherless and deprive the foreigners among you of justice. Those are the ones that Malachi says the Lord will come and place on trial. And so the New Testament picks up the theme and saying, James chapter 1, religion that our God and Father accepts as pure, faultless as this to look after orphans and widows in their distress. Paul talks about in Galatians 2 how the disciples had asked him to remember the poor and the thing that he was very excited about, the thing that he was eager to do. And again in Acts chapter 6, when there was an issue in the church early on where people were being overlooked, uh, certain populations were being overlooked, what happened? The apostles got together and prayed and they gathered and they appointed some to come and to take responsibility for that so that no one would be overlooked in that. In our world and in our church, in our lives, there's people that have no voice. And I think you already know this when we talk about this text, that it's not those who are physically unable to speak because they've been rendered uh, mute uh, by their physiology, but rather it's those who lack power altogether. Bruce Waltke, uh, a scholar, writes about some of the scenarios that might shape why someone might become uh, one without a voice here. He says they are socially and economically too weak to defend themselves against the rich and powerful. The poor may be defenseless against the powerful because they are uh, too too ignorant to counteract the obstructionist tactics of the legally savvy. We haven't seen anything like that, have we? They might be too inarticulate to state their case convincingly, and I put uh, in parentheses here, or they just don't know the language. And so they can't, they, can't convince, they can't give us or put up a defense for their case. They're too poor to produce proper evidence. They're too lowly to command respect. Or this one, the rich and powerful can bribe witnesses to accuse the poor falsely. Let me ask another question here, again rhetorical. In our nation and in our world, do we see anything like this going on? Do we see these kind of tactics that go on? Do we play these games? The wisdom of the text here, and if we can apply it locally, is that the powerful 
are to be a voice for the voiceless, that we're to be an advocate for those who have been marginalized. From the highest levels of power in our nation, all the way down to local leaders, if we want to be in the right, according to this text, then we really need to hear what the Spirit is saying to us here. And of course, it'd be easy for us to pass this responsibility on to elected officials. It'd be easy for us to say uh, to that person over there, they're in charge, uh, they're the one who's responsible for this. There's a German scholar uh, named uh, Arndt Meinhold who says this, and I think he's right in this when he talks about uh, the ones who are charged in Proverbs 31. He says, this charge is valid for each person in his or her sphere of activity. So we're not off the hook. So the question is here, how do we become an advocate uh, for those who do not have a voice? Let me offer a few observations here. The first one is this. It comes from a study. I don't know if you've heard of the study. It was, back, it was many, many years ago. It was, the study was uh, published. It was called From Jerusalem to Jericho. And what it was was two uh, uh, Princeton uh, uh, psychologists, John Darley and Daniel Batson, they, they took inspiration from the parable of the Good Samaritan. So they set up a, a, a test in which they took students from the seminary and they t- put them in a room and they told them that they're going to have them make a presentation in another building across campus. Uh, and so some of those folks, uh, they told them that the people in the other building, uh, they need you to get there right away because they've been waiting for you. And others, they told them, uh, don't worry about it. It's, it's, they're not ready for you yet, so take your time. And so there's various degrees of, of rush and hurry for these folks. Then they also took folks within the study and they said, I want you to come. All you are going to speak about vocation and, and talk about uh, kind of your call into in the ministry and leadership and stuff. And, and so they would go and do the, prepare themselves to do a presentation on this idea of vocation. But to some of them, they said, but we want you to use that uh, text from Luke's gospel, the parable of the Good Samaritan. You know, the one where the guy cares for the guy who's been beaten and left for dead at the hands of robbers. And so all these folks are going out. You know, some people are going fast, slow. Uh, Some are going with the Good Samaritan in mind. Some are going just off the top of their head what they're going to speak on. And here's what the study found uh, as they're going along. They had actually set up in the doorway on the way there, you, you couldn't miss them, an actor who was, who was in trouble. Like they, they were in an emergency situation. They need to be cared for in some way. And you'd literally pass by this person. And they were going to rate the people's responses uh, based on how they interacted with this person in need on the way to whatever the presentation was going to be. Here's what they found. Students who were on their way to give a talk about the parable of the Good Samaritan were no more likely to give help than students who are going to give an unrelated talk. That's what the study found. I'm going to go talk about the Good Samaritan, but I'm not going to be a Good Samaritan in the way. That's what happened. In fact, they say this uh, quote from the researchers, on several occasions, all right, underscore this, a seminary student (laughs) going to give his talk on the parable of the Good Samaritan literally stepped over the victim as he hurried on his way. All right, literally stepped over him. The second thing they saw was this, and said, hurrying did affect helpfulness. Students who were in a hurry were much less helpful toward the man in need compared to students who weren't in any rush to get to the other building. When you're too concerned about being late for a meeting, they said, they either didn't give notice or failed to give aid to someone who could have been dealing with a serious emergency. So here's the first observation uh, for us this morning. As we rush about and as we step over ones that we should be advocating for, we need to slow down. We need to slow down. In our hurry, in our rush, from point A to point B, we might be missing the voice of those who are crying out for help. We literally don't see them because we have something in mind way over here, and so we miss everybody in between. So the first observation, slow down. But you might be like, hey, Jimmy, Jimmy, I, there's, there's times in life where I have to hurry. You don't, you don't know the job I work. You don't know the pressure I face where I have to go. My, my schedule is packed. How, how am I supposed to slow down? I am I'm in such a rush. And, t- and to that, I would offer this, the words of the French Catholic priest, and this is a name that we associate with the poor today, St. Vincent de Paul. A quote from St. Vincent de Paul, who literally dedicated himself to serving the poor. He says this, if you must be in a hurry then let it be according to the old adage and hasten slowly. Friends, we have to slow down if we're going to hear. That's the first observation. Second one is this. It's to change our posture. We're going to slow down, but we also need to change our posture. 
Paul Borthwick, the author of Western Christians and Global Mission, talks about uh, this idea of, of how we approach and engage people on a global level and how we interact with them. He writes this, he says, Listen and learn. Our Western arrogance can nullify our Christian effectiveness. We need to reaffirm our commitment to humility. We need to listen and learn from Christians in Cuba and China who can teach us much about carrying the cross daily. Christians in the poorer world about finding our identity in Christ instead of in possessions or accomplishments. Christians in the Middle East and North Africa who know something about staying faithful under the pressure of Islam. People outside of our own ethnicity who live in our midst so that they can teach us what it means to have the dividing walls broken down and become one new creation in Christ. And so there's a sense there that we need to become humble in our approach. We need to change that posture that we don't come as the one who has all the answers. We don't come as the one who is in charge, uh, but rather we come as one who comes alongside and comes as an advocate. There's a person that I think is, uh, that I think is, says some really great things uh, when it comes to this idea of, of identifying with the poor, but it doesn't come from a source that you might imagine. My wife and I lived before we came to Darien, we lived in Linwood, Washington, and not far from our house was a large Lutheran church, uh, and that church, one of their, their members, probably one of their more famous members, was a travel writer that you may know named Rick Steves. Do you know Rick Steves? Uh, so Rick Steves uh, is a member of this Lutheran church, and he talks about this. He, he's in an interview he's about why, he is, uh, why he's Lutheran, and here's what Rick Steves says in that. He says, I'm a Lutheran because it fits my personality. And he does a little list of the ways that it fits his personality. But one of them is this. Stand up to authority when the truth needs a hand. To stand up to authority when the truth needs a hand. And Rick Steve talks about his role as a travel writer as being this one who serves as a medieval court jester. That the king dispatches out to get in and amongst those who are in our communities and in our world that the king can't trouble themselves with. And so the jester in, the, in medieval times would go out and hang out with the riffraff, right? Get down there in the trenches, get down, uh, so to speak, in the gutter and, and, and hear the voice of people where they were at, where they were struggling, where they were suffering, and then come back to the king and report what they found. And so Rick Steve sees his role, his calling as his travel writer, as being one who reports back what he has learned from other cultures with the hope that it might transform the people that he is in conversation with. He's trying to be a voice, even within a vocation that's not traditionally seen as a humanitarian type vocation. And the last one, uh, observation, is this. Uh, it's one that comes right from the text, to speak up. My wife was laughing on the couch, uh, I think it was last week actually, she was cracking up, she was reading through these posts online, and she came across this one uh, in which this person is trying out for the X-Men, and comes up to Professor X, and Professor X says, what's your superpower? And this, this person says, hindsight. <laughs> and Professor X looks at him and says, that's not going to help us. And he says, yes, I see that now. <laughs> when it comes to speaking up, hindsight, it's not going to help us. It's not going to help us. I think if there's anybody in this world that we could have asked about whether or not hindsight uh, was something that would help us in advocating for others, I think the name of a person named Martin Niemöller would be one right away that would tell us uh, that there's great regret that comes in hindsight. You may be familiar with Niemöller's, uh, there's a, po a famous poster made with a quote from Niemöller, which he says, uh, first they came for the communists, and I did not speak out because I was not a communist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews. I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. So a famous, famous poster from him. He was actually uh, presenting a speech in 1947 to the Confessing Church, in which he starts that out by saying, we preferred to keep silent. And as he goes on and talks about how uh, they as a people had been silent when they watched people get taken away. He ends up by saying, if we had said back then it is not right when Hermann Goring simply puts 100,000 communists in the concentration camps in order to let them die, I can imagine that perhaps 30 to 40,000 Protestant Christians would have had their heads cut off. But I can also imagine that we would have rescued 30 to 40 million people because that is what it is costing us now. I think in hindsight he looks back and says he had an opportunity that was missed to speak out. 
But what does it look like to be one who speaks out? I think we have a great example in Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Desmond Tutu, uh, if you remember apartheid in South Africa, uh, Jim Wallace actually tells this story in which he was at a, a service where Desmond Tutu is preaching and in comes all these people who flood the room, uh, government officials uh, with tape recorders and notepads, and they're ready to write down anything that Desmond Tutu says uh, at that point that they could use against him. And he says, uh, Jim Wallace relates the story and says this, he says, Desmond Tutu stopped preaching and just looked at the intruders as they lined the walls of his cathedral. And as they were standing there, and he, again, Desmond Tutu knows the full implications here of what's going to happen, this, this threat upon him. But they had already arrested Tutu and other church leaders, as Wallace writes, just a few weeks before and kept them in jail for several days to make both a statement and a point. Religious leaders who take on leadership roles in the struggle against apartheid will be treated like any other opponents of the Praetoria regime. After meeting their eyes with his own steely gaze, uh, Tutu looks at them, and he recognizes you are powerful, very powerful. But then he reminds them that he served a higher power greater than their political authority. He says, but I serve a God who cannot be mocked. Then the most extraordinary challenge to political tyranny I've ever witnessed, and again, this is Jim Wallace talking, he says, Archbishop Desmond Tutu told the representatives of the South African apartheid, since you have already lost, I invite you today to come and join the winning side. You've already lost. Because the God he serves is the winner in the end. So come be on the winning side. That's a bold move, right? That's a bold move. That's a person whose posture has been changed by the living God. That's a person who is, when confronted with a situation, when whether to speak out or not to speak out, says, I'm going all in and I'm going to speak out. That's a person who understood the teaching of Lemuel's mother in Proverbs 31. So I conclude uh, with these words. It's not just in scripture that we hear this, this type of sentiment. There's actually, uh, I was watching a video uh, this last week of a commencement uh, speaker uh, for Harvard University. Many years ago, J.K. Rowling, yes, that J.K. Rowling, was asked to come and speak at Harvard. And this is what she said, and, and tell me if this sounds familiar. If you choose to use your status and influence to raise your voice on behalf of those who have no voice, if you choose to identify not only with the powerful but with the powerless, if you retain the ability to imagine yourself in the lives of those who do not have your advantages, then it will not only be your proud families who celebrate your existence, but thousands and millions of people whose reality you have helped change. We do not need magic to change the world. We carry all the power we need inside ourselves already. We have the power to imagine better. I think Rowling is right on this one. We don't need magic. You have been made alive in Christ. You have been raised to life in baptism. You who in Christ have entered a new creation. Grateful recipient of God's grace. Supernaturally empowered by the Holy Spirit. Slow down. Change your posture. And speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. For the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and the needy. Amen.